fix I found myself on the TED stage, nervous as can be, and, and that led me here. The job experience, though, that I've ever had that's helped me the most for public speaking and definitely coaching public speaking is I was a summer camp counselor. And not just a summer camp counselor, I taught ropes course instruction. So I don't know if you've ever seen these at a camp, but we had a telephone pole. It was 20 feet above the ground. And my job was to send the campers up, have them cross it, and bring them back safely. And it's just like assigning someone a talk. You never know who's going to grab onto it, right? You've got a 13-year-old boy who's full of swagger. He says, I'm going to do this. Turns out he's the most nervous of your whole group. You've got a nine-year-old girl who seems small and unassuming. She's up and over. The whole point, though, is that crossing that thing isn't so much fun as it is a challenge. And I think we can all agree that you, you want to be able to do it, right? Everyone else is doing it. You want to be able to overcome your fears and get up and over that thing. And you may need help. That's just like like doing a talk. So I thought what we would do today is I'm going to give you some tips and tricks and cheats, not so much rules because I don't like them, but I will tell you what I say when people ask me what the first three rules of public speaking are. Does anybody out there know the three rules of real estate, the anecdotal three rules of real estate? If you could hold up your hand, if you know what I'm talking about, people say the first three rules of real estate. Anybody know this? It's a joke that the first three rules of real estate are location, location, location. So I think the first three rules of public speaking are audience, audience, audience. I think that you can coach people all year long. I think you can go to Toastmasters. I think you can go online to figure out how to be a better, better speaker. And all they're going to tell you, or mostly what they're going to tell you, very helpful stuff how you feel up there on stage, what to do with your body. And we're going to coach all of those things. And we're going to deal with that even today. But the bottom line is that it always comes down to the audience. Everything I teach always comes down to the audience because anybody can rock your living room. I have my living room chairs think I'm a God, but the audience always pays, whether it's with money or with time or with both. And they came there to look at something and you've got to give them something to look at. And that's also sort of the, the vibe I'm kind of going for. But let's do uh, the first point that I kind of got today, which is how to actually get people up and talking. And I'll just tell you right now, if you are joining us and you are a student and I'm looking at you, um, some of our Indian students, we might call on you right now. So you, what you'll do is you'll reach up and you'll click off your mute and you will, uh, well, you'll have to you'll have to perform is what's going to happen. So it's tough to assign someone to give a talk. My whole thing is to try to break people out of this assignment model, right? I'm assigning you to give a talk. At the end of the semester, you're going to give a talk. At the end of the week, you're going to give a talk. I think that's scary. I think it's reasonably scary, meaning it's reasonable if you find it scary. If someone came in today and said, okay, right now, and said, you're going to give a talk in a week, I'd start thinking about it. And I'd be a little bit anxious. So what I try to do is not have it be so much that assignment. I like to raise the stakes very slowly. And, and here's how I do it. I think that there are four things about giving a talk. And I'm always trying to mute these and build on them. So here are what I think I see and I'm trying to play with when I see a talk. And go to, go to any tech video, any text edit text video. Here's what I think you're seeing. I think you're seeing an audience. I think you're seeing a stage. You're seeing a speaker. And you're seeing a subject. That's, that's fair. Now, what I try to do is get, get rid of one or two or three or even four of those. So here's what I would do if I were with a group of people and they're young and they're, everybody's really nervous. I don't want a stage and an audience and all that pressure. I'm trying to get rid of that. So what I would do is I would seat everybody in a circle. Now there's no real audience and there's no real stage. And I would just have us do what I call the never ending intro. It's where I say, You've got to be an announcer. You've got to put on your best announcer voice. All you're doing is introing the person next to you or across from you or someone at random. This eliminates the speaker too, because they're not even them. They're supposed to be playing a role. So what we would do, if you'd sit in a group and it would just be us in a big circle. There's no stage, there's no audience. We're all just playing a game. And I'd say, ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Tina. And then Tina would smile, well, ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Charlene. Charlene would say, ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Gail. And we just go around until everybody's done. That's that's the start, right? I've gotten rid of a speaker, an audience, a topic even, because we're just introducing it. And I've gotten rid of, out of um, 
the, these things that'll scare you. So let me just give you some exercises that have worked to sort of build on, on how that goes. One good thing to get people talking, again, you're trying to minimize the time that they're up there. Let's say there is a stage. Let's say you make an X in your classroom. You make it out of tape and you say, hey, we're all going to come up here, right? We're, we're going to deal with the fact that it is a stage. Eventually, we're going to have to deal with the stage. I like to have people imitate somebody else. Most people, especially here in New York City, have a relative that they can imitate. Most people can really imitate a relative really well. In New York, I ask my students, do you have a parent or a grandparent who doesn't speak English or speaks English with an accent? And of course, everybody does because it's New York City. And, and I said, well, just imitate them for me. And just imitate that aunt or that grandma or your uncle calling you to dinner. And the results are hysterical, right? They're very loving because people like their relatives, but you get to hear people doing voice. And what it is, again, I'm trying to make it easier on the speaker. I don't want you to have to be up there and be yourself right from the jump. So you get up there and be somebody else. If you're a relative, if you're a vaudeville introducer, it makes it, it, makes it much easier. But let's say that we are having a stage and we do have an audience and we're trying to get people just talking a little bit. And I like to do an exercise just from the beginning. And in fact, this is how I would probably start a class with, with older students who are used to the idea that they're gonna give a talk. In fact, let's try it right now. And, and Tisha, you're gonna be first. You can hear me? Tisha, hold up your hand if you can hear me. All right, so un Tisha unmuted because she knows how this is gonna go. So I'm gonna have you do this first exercise, okay? And I got I got a stopwatch here. And you're gonna give a talk right now and it's going to be in between 10 and 20 seconds, okay? If you go under 10, I'm gonna make you go over. And if you do over 20, I'm gonna make you do it again, all right? You can't say like or well or um, you can say anything you want, even nonsense, but it has to be in between 10 and 20 seconds and your talk has to start with the words, I believe. Do you want an example or do you want to jump right into it? Uh, I, I start. You want an example, got it. Um, here's how I would do it. I'm gonna time myself. I had bananas for breakfast, okay? So I'm gonna look right in the camera. I believe that bananas are an important part of my personal breakfast journey. I bought two today from a fruit vendor. They cost 35 cents. If I'd bought four, it would have cost a dollar. Thank you. Oh, look at me, 14 seconds. I did my talk. Let's see if Tisha can do that. You ready, Tisha? Now, nice and loud, I'd like you to look right into the camera. I'd like you to keep that amazing smile you've got. And whenever you're ready, I'll start timing you. But nice and loud, clear, and let's rock us with your I believe whenever you're ready. Yeah, ready. I start. Whenever you're ready. Hello? Can you hear me? I can hear you. Whenever you're ready, Tisha, just do your talk. Studies are an important part of my life, so I do not like doing them so much. But yes, for every student, it is important. We get to learn every day and uh, discuss with our peers and enjoy school life. Damn. Nailed it. All right, so let's. usually when I have people come up and do it, I go a little bit easy on the first people that go, right? You just have them say, hey, good job, and sit down, because they volunteered to go first, or in Tisha's case, I volunteered her. But let's talk a little bit about what Tisha did. I like how Tisha actually told me when to start. She was like, watch this. This is about to happen. Start that clock. And then she did, in fact, nail it. I have her at 1830, but that's because I didn't know when Tisha ended. And you do need to know when you're going to start, which you certainly let me know you were starting. You also need to know when you're going to end. And here's a great way to do it. The way I did it was say, thank you. You all knew that I was done. The audience actually wants to clap. They want to give you feedback. So you need to let them know when that is. There's a bunch of ways to do it. And they're all very easy. You can say the end. You can say thank you. You can nod. Or you can say that's all. Anyway, nice job, Tisha. Let's try, let's try one more. Does someone want to volunteer? Does, it, does anybody want to volunteer to do, a, 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 to do an I believe? Right, exactly. That's exactly right. And you wouldn't have to, right? That's, that's usually what you're going to get. It will be people who are just sort of, uh, you know, 
thinking hey, it'll happen to somebody else. Well, here's, here's what you're doing right now, which is being really very helpful. One of the key tips to being a good speaker is to be a good audience member. And this is something to really, really teach. Your audience should be louder than necessary. Your audience should be more engaged than necessary. And in all cases, the golden rule applies. If you wouldn't want someone on a texting dialogue while you're giving your talk, then don't whip out your cell phone. These are obvious things, but they build up into the fact that we can make a team out of it. I perform all the time. I've had wondrous you know, ovations I was really flattered by, but I never, ever, ever said, no, stop, stop, it's too much. People, are, people love me too much. That doesn't happen. So as an audience member, give that energy. And, uh, and since no one wants to volunteer, which I totally understand, I wouldn't if I were you either, because it's scary. We're going to let Tisha pick who's next. Tisha, can you see other speakers on your screen right now? Real quickly, pick somebody that you'd like to hear from next. Uh, I can't see everyone right now. Well, just pick somebody. Uh, Quick. Uh, Aishwarya. Aishwarya. I thought it would be her. Aishwarya, can we see you? Can we see Ashwarya? If we can't, we're going to have to go to the random. Can you hear me? Oh, yeah, we can hear you. Can you hear us? All right. I'm jumping to somebody else. You want to pick, Flo? Uh, I am volunteer here. I'm sorry? I am volunteer. Oh, you're going to volunteer? How do you say your name? Parissa? Yes, Parisa. All right, Parisa. You want to do the same assignment or you want to do a wild card question? Uh, I can't go for a new assignment. You can't? Or you can't? I can't. All right. I'd like you to also do in between 10 and 20 seconds. Between 10, okay. But I'm going to change the topic since you said you could go for a new one. Okay. And it's going to be, my favorite person on the planet is. Okay. Whenever you're ready, in between 10 and 20 seconds, you can't say, um, okay, or like, right? You're going to look into that camera. You're going to keep that killer smile you've got, and you're going to give us a talk. Whenever you're ready, I'll start the clock. I'm ready to write down. You just start talking, and I start timing. Okay. Hello, everyone. Uh, I want to talk about my favorite person in this planet. And that could be no one other than my mom, who done everything for me to make the best out of me. And I can say I'm proud of her for all the effort she put in. Thank you. Nice. Nailed it. 17 seconds. We knew when she started. We knew when she stopped. So now we would normally, if we were in a workshop setting, have more and more people do it, constantly changing the topic. And here's why. Because there are only two kinds of people in my audience right now. And you're, you're all the audience. And there are only two kinds of you. There are people who have already spoken and people who are worried that they might have to. Right? It's normal if you are sitting there right now going, what would I say about my favorite person or what would I say about I believe or I'm not going to talk about what I had for breakfast right you should be thinking that right now but as an audience that doesn't make you the best audience that makes you anxious people right so this is something to think about when you're coaching folks when you've got people in the audience and they're all doing the same topic you've got to throw them curves and multiple curves and here's one of the things that I do when I assign people topics sometimes and it takes a little prep like I could have told Parisa oh, I want you to give a minute long talk. I want you to go off and think about it because it's involved and I want you to come back. Uh, I would get her out of, the, out of the way, out of the room if we were all together so that I wouldn't have someone in the audience who was actually not listening, who was actually very reasonably making her own talk. It's really something to think about as far as that being a good audience member. So let's think of some more things that you can say. I'll tell you some things that really happen. Again, what we're trying to do is minimize either the stage or the audience or the speaker or the topic. 
What I like to do is make people think that they're given a choice. I told Parisa she could take the easy one or the wild card. Parisa is brave. She cho chose wild card and did a nice job with it. But there are a bunch of questions you can ask. And I encourage you to go to the web and look at book of questions. There are all these funny questions, icebreaker questions. There are millions of questions that you can ask people. And I literally will come up with different ways so that people think they have a choice. For example, maybe Carla's next in our room. And I bring up Carla and I say, Carla, I'm gonna draw two questions from the book of questions. I'm gonna draw two of them and I pull up two of them and Carla gets to choose which one to answer. That way it makes it look like Carla has a choice in the matter. Now she doesn't, right? We made Carla get up and we made her do a talk, but it makes her think she's got a choice in the matter. And there's there's more exercise like that. And if we had time, I would do more of these so you can see, but you get the idea, right? The other thing is to do it Secret Santa style. I don't know if, uh, if our Indian friends have Secret Santa, but it's where someone is assigned someone else to give a gift to. Well, you can assign someone to ask a question of somebody. You can pass around a card with Tina's name on it and say, hey, three different people need to write three different questions for Tina. We're not going to say who wrote them. We're just going to have them. And so when Tina gets up to do her talk, she doesn't know what's coming. That's why I've let her be in the audience instead of outside working on her talk. I'll say, Tina, we got three questions for you from the audience. You have to pick one. And the questions are, who are your siblings? What's your sign? And... What's the worst day of your life? Tina can go for the vulnerable, embarrassing one of what's the worst day of your life, or she can go easy and say, well, my sibling is Tom and Dale, and she sits down, right? It's just a way of doing that. And the other thing is to make a series of questions. You can bring three people up on stage at the same time. Okay, I'm gonna bring Joey and Parisa and Carla up on stage. And I'm gonna say, all right, you're each gonna give a 30 second talk. One's going to talk about, about a broken bone, one's going to talk about a broken heart, and one's going to talk about a broken promise. Who wants what? And Carla's going to say, I'll take broken bone, because Carla does not want to talk about a broken promise or a broken heart, which means that Parisa does. And you, know, and you can play games like this so that it's a matter of choice, and that, that helps. Uh, once you've got people up and talking about actual things, right, you can start to boost the time involved for their talk. You can actually assign talks. Uh, I've had a good success, success with the, a Google map project. There's always one tech student who's really into tech and I say, okay, you're gonna, get, you're gonna open Google Earth for us. And every single one of us here today or in the room is going to put a pin on Google Maps of the most important place to them on the planet. Put a pin and then we're gonna call people up and you're just gonna do a talk about your pin. Could be summer camp, could be your elementary school, could be your home, could be your grandparents' grave. Right? But what, and so it, we're all on the same map. You know, we're, we're not so much an audience, we're all sharing the same thing. I've had good success with that, especially with older students. The other one I've had really good success with is uh, what's the most important photo in your iPhone right now or in your smartphone? We're pretty much are probably all carrying a, a phone with camera, and there's probably one picture about right now, if I told you I got, there's a, you're, you're about to, you can only send me one photo. Please send me that photo. And then I stick it all in a deck. And sometimes I put it at random and I say, well, here's a photo of a young girl and she's at a lake. Whose photo is this? Come on up and tell me about this, right? You get a little prep time. You also get a little personal kind of thing. So this is going to take us to our next topic, which is picking a topic. This is pretty tough for people, right? How do you pick a topic? How do you pick a topic so that it's something that you enjoy, but here's more important. How do you pick a topic, like I was telling you at the beginning, that the audience wants to hear? Those are sometimes two different things. In fact, for, for people who aren't experts yet or don't think they're an expert at a big idea worth spreading kind of topic, it's really challenging because they want something that they can talk about, but everybody's an expert at themselves. So I'll tell you a story, actually. I'll tell you a fable. It's about, um, it's about a guy named Zach. And Zach is coming home from work on a ferry boat. And he's a good guy. He's, he's tall. He's handsome. 
everybody likes Zach. He's leaning against the railing of the ferry boat, and one of his cufflinks falls off into the water, and it's gone forever, right? So it bothers him because he really liked the cufflinks. And when he gets home, his, his wife, Carol, immediately notices something's wrong. She says, what's wrong, Zach? Zach says, coming home from work on the ferry boat, one of my cufflinks fell off into the water. It's gone forever. Carol says, I tell you what, I know how to make you feel better. I'm going to make you a beautiful dinner. So sit down, relax, and, and just give me some time. Uh, you're going to feel better. So uh, Carol goes down to the village. They live in a village, apparently. And she gets to the market just as the fishermen are arriving with their afternoon catch. And she buys pretty much fresh off the boat a big, beautiful codfish. And she thinks this is going to make Zach feel better. And Carol takes the codfish home, and she bakes it with a special family recipe. She puts it on the nicest platter in the house. And then Carol feeds Zach the beautiful codfish, and Zach eats it. And you know what? Carol was right because Zach feels better. The end. That's the end of the story. And what I really like about this story is that something happened in your minds a sentence ago, however many sentences ago, you finished the story for me. You wanted, you, you knew Zach was going to find the cufflink in the fish when he ate it. You, I didn't tell you anything and you finished the story for me. First of all, I think that that's magic, that I can make you think something without even mentioning it at all. To me, that's like mind control, and it's the essence of why public speaking is so, so powerful. But what's really compelling about it is that you, you thought you'd heard it before. You were a, not an optimum audience back there a couple sentences ago. And the reason you weren't is because you're, I bored you, right? I mean, you already knew, you already knew what was coming. So here's the point. Don't let your speaker get up on stage and give us the standard cufflink story. Don't let them do it. And the reason that you shouldn't is because it's about the audience and we can do better. We can get to that magic part. And here's how I think I, I like to do it. I'm just going to tell you one process and it's worked for me. It's a little bit of a, it's a little bit of a tough one, but I think that as a facilitator, you should work on this. You should really get this going. This is your ability to move down a chain of dialogue, just a couple steps, becoming one of two things, either more personal or more specific. I would say more quirky, like the cufflink story, but the specific sometimes breeds quirky. And here's how you do it. It's a line of inquiry. I'm not going to let you do a talk about, well, here's a, here's a great example. Uh, I, there was a poetry reading, poetry competition here for young people a couple months ago, and a young woman wanted to do a talk about women body issues, how the media affects women's body issues. And this is an important topic, but this is also the most popular topic with young women in, in that school district. So I'm not going to let her do it because it's a competition. If she draws number 15 in the 16-person bout, Three or four people will have already done the topic and she's going to get up and she's going to bore people. She's not going to have the impact she wants. Important topic, I'm not going to let her do it. For the audience's sake, they're not going to want to hear that topic again. So the, the inquiry is, why do you want to do a poem about women's body issue? Well, because I struggled with anorexia when I was in eighth grade. Right, it's a pretty important topic. Did you keep it secret or did you tell somebody? Well, I told my friend Amber. Where did you meet Amber? You want to do a poem about Amber? No. Where did you meet Amber? I met Amber at ballet camp. You want to do a poem about ballet camp? Because then you can do that. So the, the young woman ended up doing a poem about the things that people at ballet camp do to lose weight. Apparently, young girls at ballet camp uh, flex their calves before they go to sleep to burn calories. They take laxatives. They do all these kind of things. And that's a very powerful poem. I didn't let her do the basic thing, but we just went down a couple a couple levels of inquiry and we can do this we can do this right now we could pick a common topic and with a couple levels of inquiry we would be on to something else if i asked everybody to think of something right now i'm going to say a word i just want you to think of geographically the first thing that comes to your mind let's think of the word swing set right playground or swing set somewhere in your mind you're thinking of a place but half of us are thinking about a swing set or a playground by our home we take our kid there, we had an incident there, we walked the dog there. The other half of us, maybe we're thinking about the swing set from when we were children. 
right? So now automatically we've got a bunch of different geographies going. And we started with the same topic, but we can't all do a talk on the same topic, but we could even do one level down, which is where is it? Tell me about that town. And we can even go one more level down. Like, let's look at what we got going on right now. There are, there are those of us, we've got people with photographs in the background, right? Laura's got photographs in the background. Joey's got a painting or something in the background, but she's probably got photographs on that entertainment center. Tina's rocking some photographs behind her. Any one of those. Any, yeah, wow, Tina, you really got some. We have, we have somebody with a photograph of a sailor. And we've got, uh, I don't know what Charlene's got. She's got some kind of banner. So it's, it's that idea is that um, I like to do an exercise called what else is in the selfie? Everybody has a selfie. You kind of got selfies going right now. I like to do an exercise called what else is in the selfie? And have to do a talk about that. And this isn't, this isn't crazy. This is actually something that would really work for you. It kind of goes like this. Um, where'd you take this selfie? All I see is your face. You look suntan. Where'd you take the selfie? I took it in some lake in Ohio two years ago. You want to talk about Ohio? No, I hated it. Do you want to talk about the lake? No, I had a bad time that summer. Okay. Well, why were you in Ohio at a lake you don't know the name of? It was close to my uncle's house. You want to talk about your uncle? No. Well, what about your uncle? What, what happened there? Well, I, my cousin lives there. Well, what do you know about your cousin? She was the first person to tell me about One Direction, the band. All right. You want to do a talk about One Direction, the band? No, I hate One Direction, the band. All right. Do you want to do a talk about hating the band One Direction? Yes, I do. Now we've got some kind of quirk, right? Now we've got an actual topic. It's the same assignment. It requires research. It requires passion. It requires dedication. It's negative, right? I hate One Direction, but maybe spin it a little. Tell me why I should also hate One Direction. Convince me, because I actually don't feel one way or the other about One Direction, but convince me with your talk, with your three minute, your five minute, 10 minute talk, a couple things. One is why you don't like One Direction so vehemently. And two, why I should join you in not liking One Direction. I will accept that. And someone, if someone had picked the topic One Direction, I wouldn't have let them do it. But if someone gets to One Direction through three layers of inquiry, that's the kind of talk. And sometimes I make people turn in an actual assignment. Show me how you got from your selfie to talking about chocolate milk, right? Uh, that I find those to be helpful. Uh, let's see. I do want to talk a little bit too about performance techniques. Let's say that you've got people and, and they've picked a topic and we've done some warm up exercises and you know what? They're, they're aware they're going to have to actually give this talk. Well, you want that to be a good talk, right? You want them to be a good public speaker. So let's talk about some of those, those things. Uh, First of all, it, a lot of the questions can be answered by what does the audience want? And one tip that I like to do for people who are public speaking, I like to have them sit in the last seat in the theater or the room. I've done it in tiny rooms. I've done it in huge theaters. Just sit in the back. One thing I like to do actually is I like to sit in the back. I like to have someone else on stage Usually it's a tech guy because we're about to start the conference. And I just hold up my thumb and my forefinger and I just put it, I just like grab whoever's on stage from where I'm sitting. If you're in even a normal size theater, that person is tiny, which will teach you something. You got to be big up there. Boy, they say the camera adds 10 pounds. Well, a normal theater adds or takes away 15% of you. So automatically on stage, no matter how big you are, and I've seen a former NBA all-star speak. He's seven one. He's still small on stage. So you got to make yourself physically bigger. What kind of clothes should you wear? What does it look like from the back? And here's another question is how loud should you be? What does it sound like from the back? Here's another exercise that you can do with soft speakers. Almost everybody I've found speaks softer than they need to, or they're speaking for that front row. Now, a lot of times you'll have audio visual equipment, but you know, you'll, you'll have a magnified voice, but that doesn't matter. I'm talking about most of these, these rooms. Here's a really good exercise. 
let's say you've got a speaker up there and she's, she's quiet. She's just a little bit quiet. I have everybody in the room close their eyes. I say, you and me, you know, it's, it's Chelsea and Chelsea's kind of quiet. I'll get up there with Chelsea and I'll say, Chelsea, you're kind of quiet. Everybody in the audience, please close your eyes. And then I say, when Chelsea's too loud, I want you to hold up your hand. Don't mess with her, but when Chelsea's too loud for the room, I don't care if we're in a theater or a tiny room, when Chelsea gets to the point where she's too loud, just hold up your hand. You got your eyes closed. Chelsea, I want you to say the same sentence over and over again, louder each time. Hi, my name is Chelsea. 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 People will hold up their hands at about the same point. They're not messing with Chelsea. They're telling her that was a little bit too loud but they will hold up their hands much later than Chelsea thinks they should. Chelsea's amazed up there at how she's not being too loud. Chelsea thinks she's screaming at a certain point. The audience just doesn't think she's too loud. It shows you how much louder you can be without being too loud. And that's the level that you should practice at. It should be big, right? Because it needs to be. A lot of beginning speakers like to ask questions about nerves. In fact, if I did workshops on nerves, it could take up the entire workshop. That's all anybody cares about. It's totally reasonable. And I've asked a lot of my really kick-ass friends, how do you deal with nerves? And I've heard some answers that I don't think are really true. Oh, I channel my nerves. I, I don't know. I remember from when I was a ropes course instructor, nerves hit you here, right? They cause stuttering. They make you forget. I think that nerves go away with practice. I'm, I'm sure they do. So one big, big help for nerves is just the sentence, breathe on purpose. I've heard people say, breathe quick, breathe slow. What I like to tell my speakers, especially when they're about to go up, I just say, breathe on purpose. Why? Because at least you have control over that, right? Your heart is racing totally naturally, and you just feel like a rabbit in an open field with tigers everywhere. Why? Because you are, evolutionarily, there's no reason you should be up there sticking your head up in front of all these dangers. So breathe on purpose. It really helps. And here's the other one that you just need to keep hitting and keep hitting and keep hitting. When we get a speaker up on stage and that speaker isn't smiling, I like to say, oh, you know, your, your talk was fantastic. You know what, Tom? You remind me of something. You know who has an excellent smile? Do you know who has a like a particularly nice smile? Do you know who has a, an absolutely wonderful smile? And when Tom says who, I say everybody. Everybody has a nice smile. If you are not smiling up there on stage to show that you're comfortable, to show that you care about being up there, you're you're losing points. You're you're losing an opportunity. Unless you're talking about genocide, and even then, you should be smiling up there because it helps. I want to talk about a couple other just performance tips and tricks. One is if I could pass along one thing, and it's really difficult to do here in uh, Cyberland, but if I could pass along one tip for effective public speaking, just one, I only had 10 seconds to pass along one tip, it would definitely be eye contact eye contact because no one i've met is perfect at it everyone could be better at it and we can practice this and we should we should be looking our loved ones in the eyes more we we absolutely should be looking our family into the in the eyes more and we should be looking our colleagues in the eyes more we should be looking strangers in the eye more and we should definitely be doing it on stage so here's one tip that I have. Uh, when I first started and I was nervous, I would pretend like the entire audience had laser vision. Two laser beams coming out of their eyes and landing right in my solar plexus. Everybody in the theater. But I pretended that my vision extinguishes lasers. And by the end of my talk, three minutes, 10 minutes, 18, an hour, I extinguished the entire audience. I put them out. I just extinguished it. Practice it. Now, honestly, sometimes if there's a balcony or if there are people in the extreme wings or people right down front, I sometimes skip those people, right? I can only look around so much. But it's really helpful when people come up to you afterwards and you've spoken to, say, 2,000 people, and they say, I felt like you were looking right at me. Say, well, I, I hope I was. That's the eye contact. One is movement. 
people get up and they move a lot. They don't know what to do. Should I move? Should I not move? I like to move around the stage a lot, but I think for a beginning speaker, I think you're probably moving out of nerves. So I'd like to practice with people how to just stop and pop, stay in one place and do your talk. So when I get someone who's moving around a little, I take two quarters, you can take any kind of coins and I put them on each shoe. And I say, I want you to do the talk you just gave. Right? We could do Parisa talking about her mom. Uh, she'd be up there. Uh, and I just want you to do it without shaking the coins off. It's a real good way of just teaching that posture. Uh, another thing that people always want to do, know is what to do with your hands. This is a real surprising topic. I've never had this problem because I'm very expressive with my hands. I don't mind it. I think that that's the way I like to talk. People always wonder what to do with their hands. First of all, do what comes naturally. You could just hold your hands at the side. That's what people do. They feel like two big bunches of bananas. But if you have a question about what to do with your hands, script your hands. There are plenty of times in your talk where you need to add emphasis. Hands are perfect for that. Or as I should say, hands are perfect for that, right? They add the emphasis, not just uh, of, the, of the topic, but with the body language. And, and then it's nice to look. Plus you can be smooth with this. You can weigh things. You can totally rule things out. But whatever that motion was that someone's doing up on stage naturally, you should coach them to do it 20% bigger. If someone says, I didn't know whether to stay or to go, that's pretty good. But from the last seat in the house, it should be, I didn't know whether to stay or to go. Just big, so big I almost left the screen. Um, this brings us up to the another point of just how to deliver that talk. Most people are just reciting a talk, right? Just getting up and kind of reciting it. It's because they're trying to remember the darn thing. So I have two ways to sort of break a monotone. First of all, if you're afraid of forgetting your talk, how about this? Don't forget your talk. It's, it's the best way to make sure that you won't forget your talk is to not forget your talk. And I, I know that's a glib thing to say, but there are ways to do it. And here's how I do it. And I do this in hotel rooms. I don't own a television set, but I do this every time the night before in some hotel around the globe. I think I've got my talk ready. I think I have it memorized. I turn on the television. I turn it onto a talking head program, an interview program. I turn it up a little bit louder than normal. I stand in front of the TV. I hold my leg behind me even. Sometimes I put my laptop on the bed. I can't see it, but I can see it in the mirror so I can follow it along. And I do my entire talk. If I can survive that without messing up, I'm not gonna forget my talk the next day. I also sometimes make myself smile and if I stop smiling, I have to start over. If I mess up or stop smiling, I have to start over. I find that that really helps for the memorization. The other thing to tell speakers is, I want to hear bullet points, italics, or all caps. I don't care where you put them. I don't care if you start me high and end me low or start me low and end me high, but I wanna hear modulation. I wanna hear some point be more important than some other point because language is a wonderful thing. And if I tell you go to the milk and buy me a can of armadillo, armadillo should be getting the emphasis right? Because it's, it's all language. So I want to, I want to go to a Q and a in a little bit, but I want to just get to sort of my last point. And it's, it's a little bit high flown because it's about, it's about passion or about why we do this kind of thing. So I'll tell you another story. I'll tell you another story about Zach. How about that? I'll tell you a story about Zach and I, I, let's, let's pick Zach's cufflinks. This time, Zach is going on a big trip and he's on the back of a steam train. It's just like you picture in the movies, right? That's, that's what Zach is doing. And he's on the very back of the train and Zach has saved one of the cufflinks from when he lost the one and he's had replicas made. Actually, Carol did it for him. Yeah, Carol went and got replica cufflinks made and they're beautiful. They mean a lot to Zach and they're, and they're lovely. They're actually, they're quite expensive. And he's, he's got them and he's leaning against the back of the train and, and the train starts taking off from the station. And when it does, Zach hasn't learned his lesson. One of Zach's cufflinks falls off 
it just falls off. There's no way he's going to get this. The train is moving out. He's not going to be able to get this cuff length. So Zach does something compelling and quick. He immediately takes off the other cufflink and throws it with the first one. And I've heard stories like this, and people bring this up as an example of sort of philanthropic thinking. I don't know if that's what that is. I don't know what Zach is thinking. I think I do, though. Zach is thinking ahead that he, he one cufflink is of no use to Zach, although presumably he could match it with the other one. Anyway, but, but Zach wants someone to enjoy the cufflinks. You need two cufflinks to really make a set. And Zach wants someone, if he can't have them, to do that. I think Zach is thinking about his audience. I think Zach is thinking about an audience that doesn't even exist. And I think that that's what we should be doing with, with public speaking. And the one, the one point I want to pass on is that as, as facilitators or administrators and as young people out there, if you were asked to give a talk, you are probably in a good place in your life. You're probably in a very good place in your life. You're at a school learning something new, or you're an expert on a topic, or your best friend is getting married. So let's just remember that. Let's just remember that. And I like to do something I call toast the bridegroom. You get asked to give a talk for the same reason you get asked to toast the bridegroom. You're the guy. You know what to say. You should probably run out of attention span and time long before you run out of things to say you should you should you're an expert on the bridegroom you could go on for hours now you shouldn't here's what you should do you should go to the wedding you should enjoy the wedding you shouldn't worry about toasting the bridegroom you've prepared and furthermore the stakes aren't that high and it's not about you but when you get up to toast the bridegroom toast the bridegroom Give your love away, make yourself vulnerable, tell a story or multiple stories within a normal time limit about this topic that you care so much about. And then take your seat. And the reason you're taking your seat is because dancing is about to happen. You're going to take your seat, someone that you love or admire is going to compliment you, take the compliment and then go out and dance. Because that's what it's about. So I always remind people, I tell them the, the toast the bridegroom topic, and I constantly remind them of that. That's what we're doing up there. We're toasting the bridegroom. It's about what the audience wants to see and what the audience wants to do. We want to dance, and we want to be around people that we love. So we've got eight minutes where we can take some questions. Do you have any questions? They can be as specific as you like, and, um, and I'll listen. You can unmute yourself. On the uh, on the upper right there, anybody have any questions about uh, what I've said, or just in general? If you don't, I will make you uh, do a talk. Wow, that was that was dramatic. Does anybody have any questions? I actually have a question. Dave. Stephanie has a question. So, <laughs> Um, so something I've learned from Reeves is, uh, and this is just from a message of him, is that he's always really good at talking about something with passion. And um, it's very inspiring. So personally, I got the chance to sit in the audience and listen audience. to him speak. And he quite literally brought me to tears, uh, which I would not admit to you normally, but I'm just opening up here. Um, but, you know, I think one thing that's difficult for me, but also difficult at all stages of life is, is really figuring out what that passion is. And as part of TED Ed Clubs, we're asking students this really difficult question of what is something that you're passionate about, right? I see Parisa uh, nodding her head probably because she struggles with this. And I guess my question to you, Reeves, is how can we encourage people or how can we ourselves reflect on what we're passionate about? Well, this it's a it's a good question especially if you filter it through the idea of of public speaking right because as i told you i do think it's about the audience 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 so not only do you have to figure out what you're passionate about but you really do it, unless you're arrogant you have to figure out what these people want to hear so i always like to inspire a feeling of i can't wait to share this with these people i think when you walk out to the microphone 
or out on that stage, I, I like to recite my first line, whatever I'm about to say. But what I think that you should be doing is you should have an idea of, I can't wait to share this with these people. I'll, I'll copy what Kelly Stetzel, my TED Youth co-host and the TED content director likes to say. She says they're you know, good, great, and excellent talks. A good talk is when you say, this is what I do. And a great talk is when you say, this is what I do, and this is why I care about it. Well, already you got a great talk if you just explain to people and telegraph why, why you care about it. But an excellent talk is, this is what I do. This is why I care about it. And this is why you should care about it. And if you watch the most successful TED Talks, pretty much everybody does this. And we saw something phenomenal at TED this year, and Chris Anderson even commented on it. We saw a guy get up and do a talk about parasites and then get a standing ovation. And as Chris mentioned, you just got a standing ovation for content and passion, right? We had someone do a talk about spiders and she didn't manage to get that level across. You have spent thousands of hours, thousands of hours thinking about something. And it's really easy with young people because it, it's not a problem finding the passion. Now, sometimes the passion comes across as indignation or self-righteousness or political naivete. Well, I'll take all of those things if, if it still brings out passion. So somewhere in a federal judge was a 17-year-old girl who was concerned with injustice, right? I always say when you talk to young people, talk to young people like they're your future oncologist because they are. 30 years from now, you're going to have a tumor and walking into that room with an x-ray of your duodenum is this young person you're talking to. You're not smarter. You're just older. You had more time in it. So, But back up to whatever you were, whatever took you on this path in life, back up to what that was that got you there and care, 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 care. And want to share that with people. That's that's what I would suggest. Is that too vague or I think it's toast the bridegroom. It's you want to add your voice to to life. Reeves. The other, it, yes. Oh, oh sorry. Um I, we have a question from Joey and Subashri has a question about fear. How um how do you make the audience related to it? I guess how do you conquer those fears in that way? Um, and then Joey, I've unmuted you, so you can go ahead and ask your question if you're, uh, if you're ready. Okay. Oh, I see. I see. I'm going to read Zavashi's so, so question. Oh. Just one second, Joey. Uh, my topic is about fear. How do I make the audience gotcha. related to it? Well, I, I'm not exactly sure about the, the 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 take that you like. First of all, if you yourself are fearful, there I often say the audience will respond to many things. The audience will respond to the attractiveness volume, clownishness, humor. One thing an audience never responds to is anxiety. It's so tough, right? We're, we're, we're afraid of someone up there. So you need to conquer those things through experience and practice before you get up there. You shouldn't bring anxiety to the stage. Your audience doesn't want to see it. You don't want it. And there are many, many different techniques to get, to get over these things. And you can read these online or we, again, we could do a whole talk about them. But here's what I'd like to suggest. I used to worry about forgetting my talk, and I've forgotten my talk three times, twice in very high-profile places. Well, I don't care so much anymore about getting my, forgetting my talk because I just don't. I'm a pretty smart guy, and I care. And when I get up there, you know that I re rehearsed my speech. You know that I've spent hundreds of hours on it. Well, I forgot it. Not that big a deal. And in both cases, that was being filmed, and in the film, you can't tell at all that I forgot. It's not that big a deal. So I think it's also a way of make yourself vulnerable to the audience. You can come out and say, you know what, guys? I'm terrified right now. You will get immediate recognition and, and love from the audience. Never, never be afraid to be vulnerable. It almost always works. And when it doesn't work, forget those people. They're bad people, <laughs> right? You can be vulnerable, and I think that you should. And just that's the one way to deal with it. Don't fake it. If you can't, if you are in fact nervous, we're going to see your hands shake when you read off your note cards and we're going to see your foot tremble. You can tell us, or you can just be open and say, you know what? I'm, you don't even have to say it. You can just with your demeanor say, of course I'm afraid, but you know what's more important is getting up here and doing my talk about snowboards. 
Joey, what uh, what was your uh, question? Oh, it was just about um, memorizing versus familiarizing. Is we've had kids like in our TEDx youth event sort of debate this back and forth, like memorizing it word for word versus using their slides as their. And my inclination is is not to memorize it word for word because they get so like it sounds so rehearsed. So I was just wondering, um, you said like, don't forget your talk. So that made me think, uh oh, I'm giving the bad advice. So just wondering about that. This is something I think you can debate forever and ever. Chris Anderson and I were just talking about this. Let's take a, let's take a look at what you gain and what you lose. If you memorize your talk, <clears throat> you'll probably be as concise as possible, right? Because it's written. If you're a good writer, you've made it concise. And also there's the security of, well, I just got to get through this. So that's something that you gain. What you gain with not memorizing your talk and maybe using your slides as a prompt is you gain a little bit of informality and maybe audience connection. I would like to put one point out there, which is if you really memorize your talk, you've got it so down that it's like a tune in your head. You can do it fast or slow. It, there's no way of forgetting it because it's it's got a rhythm of a song. You can get the same audience connection. You can tinker with your audience connection. You can tinker with the casualness. I, that's what I like to do. I like to learn my talk so well that now I can be casual about it. Why? Because I'm nailing it. But let's say you don't have the time. That's the other condition. Well, it takes a long time to memorize your talk. Let's say you don't have the time. Then I would absolutely, I, I structure my slide deck so that one click will get me to a place. In other words, it's the slide first and then the explanation about it. And if I lose my place, I just didn't have enough time to prepare a talk. That's fine. And I get up there and I say, where am I? Click, ah, cornfield. The cornfield, blah, 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 and I'm back on. I think both methods work. I would, I will say though, that for high stakes talks, like a TED, this conversation becomes crazy to me. If, you, if you're not memorizing your talk along with all these slides that you prepared for something as high stakes as sort of like an 18 minute TED talk or a TEDx talk, I think you're personally nuts. I don't, I'm, I'm an improv guy. I am not going to go out there and expect me, expect my casualness and my glib off the cuff remarks to match what I could have written. No way. If I want to be glib and casual, I'm going to memorize the crap out of my talk, and then I'm going to pretend like I'm casual. Now, that's what I would have had to do. But both both ways are, are worth entertaining, I think. I don't know if there's an answer. Did you want to wrap up, yeah. or did you want to? Um... Oh, yeah, you know, this is a good question from Vidya. I'll just I'll mention this. Is can, can he tell us how he prepared for his first talk, the nervousness and research and hard work? My first talk wasn't anything that needed research, but Chris asked me to do poems. He asked me to do three poems, day one, day two, and day four. It was nice because it meant that I got a lot of, right? I, I could leave people with something at the end. I got a lot of hallway recognition at the beginning. I didn't have to research anything. I was petrified. My first talk, day one, I went out, I was so, so nervous for the reason people are, right? I can't believe that I'm doing this. And I will pass something on that I think, I don't know how you can pass this on because it's, it's experience and it's hard to pass on. The first thing I thought when I, not the first thing, I was about 40 seconds into my first poem. My first poem is thir three minutes long. At the 40 second mark, I actually got out of my head because I thought, you know what? I worried too much about this. As a performer, as a poet, as a human being, I realized I worried too much about it. I don't know how to pass that on to you because you can tell people that and they're like, oh, screw you. I'm going to worry as much as I want. But I definitely had that feeling. So that's the answer to your question. Was I nervous? Completely. I tried all the tactics I could use. And if you want to see, you can see it on state, uh, on screen. The first talk I ever gave at TED, well, this is the first time at TED. It's not the first talk, but it's my third talk on day four. It's my poem, Mockingbird. And in my poem, I recite 20 different sayings from the previous days. They won't make any sense to you because you didn't attend all four days of the conference. But I will tell an anecdote. I was supposed to go after Majora Carter. And Majora Carter was sitting right next to me. She was so nervous, she had to make an emergency run to the bathroom. And then it was her time to come up. And I'm trying to memorize my poem because after Majora, I'm going to go. Majora has 18 minutes, then me. She's in the bathroom. Chris says, looks to the empty seat beside me and says, and now Majora caught, um, is Majora there? And I said, Chris, she's going to be right back. And he said, well, 
would you like to go and just switch places? And I said, rock and roll, let's do it. I, I think even to this day that if Chris hadn't done that, I probably would have messed up my poem, right? Because I would have thought about it and thought about it. But because I was thrown in, I didn't get that one more chance, I didn't mess it up. And so that's the poem Mockingbird that's online. That's a very scared person that you're looking at online still though, even though it was my third time performing that, that week. Uh, anybody, uh, anybody else? Yes. Manav? Is it Manav? If you want to mute your... Uh... Yep, you can hear me? I can hear you, yes. Okay, so say we're going for the TED Talk for the first time. How do we uh, like preserve the aud audience interest? Or what would be the one factor or method by which we can catch the audience interests? Well, you know, the, the question is how do you get your audience, audience interest about this topic? Look... <clears throat> Uh, I don't know if you've seen my re most recent TED talk. It's about four in the morning. I was walking in the city a month ago and a woman stopped me. She said, did you do a TED talk about four in the morning? I said, uh, yes, I did. She said, I was watching it last night with my daughter. My daughter's 15. I turned to my daughter and said, see, this man did a talk about nothing. His talk was about nothing. And it was great. I thought, well, that's a great compliment. Um, but it's true. There are a bunch of different ways to get audience attention, and you should be trying every single one of them. Drama, surprise, humor, wardrobe, passion, vulnerability, all of the things that would normally make an audience perk up. The one that I tried earlier was also successful, but I led you along on it, right? I'm, I'm confident enough that you're not going to kick off, but I told you the cuffling story that doesn't make sense till the very end. I had to do a minute story. You shouldn't do that, right? If you're worried about audience participation, then you start off and you just give it the most provocative first sentence you ever can. I want to tell you about the man who killed my pride. What? I want to tell you why World Cup is worthless. Right? I want to tell you why One Direction should be banned from playing. Right? Something, you, there are a bunch of ways to do it. And it's, so it's, it's a good question, but there are many, many answers to it. If you want audience attention, what gets audience attention? Don't warm up. Don't say, hi, my name is Gene. My company provides low cost. I can no, man. Jump right out and say 10,000 people will go blind from cataracts in the next 20 minutes. All right. So start big, I guess is what they say. Uh, we you. good? Great. Um, Thank you very much. Uh, if you have questions, you can email them and we, I'll try to answer them uh, secondary. And maybe we'll do it again sometime. Maybe we can even do a workshop so you can see how it works. Uh, it would be nice if we maybe, Ted, we could do a class or something so we can be so, with new people. Anyway, thank you very much. Uh, I appreciate it. And here's Steph. And thank you so much, Therese. Can we do a quick clap? I know that some of you are muted, but let's just do a quick clap here because um, I know it's a little bit different online, but um, oh, that was really fantastic and, and such a good workshop. I hope you, you're still clapping. I love it. Um, I hope you all found this helpful. Um, we really do hope to continue doing workshops like this throughout the club experience. So especially for those who um, are starting a new club, definitely feel free to email us at tededclubs at ted.com with um, any suggestions you have, anything that you think would be helpful for your group. But we will be releasing a program calendar with different speakers and different workshops that will be coming up and that'll come out early September, hopefully. So definitely keep an eye out for that. And um, we also send out a newsletter every Monday that highlights which workshops coming up. So keep an eye for that. Um, it was a pleasure having you all here. I hope you all enjoyed it. Uh, I saw a lot of smiling, a lot of nods, especially thank you to those who stepped up and were put on the spot and did a little bit of a presentation yourself. Uh, we hope to have Reeves back in, in October or November, so keep an eye peeled for that. It's always exciting, always fun. Um, and if you have any additional questions that you want to ask, uh, feel free to email those to tededclubs at ted.com and we'll make sure those get to him. Thanks so much for joining us, everybody. Thanks, guys. Bye. Bye. Thank you.